Okay, so we are ready to start. Okay. Welcome to the video for this module, uh, which includes a conversation with Professor John Landy. Professor Landy is the Isidore Loeb Professor Emeritus of Law at the University of Missouri School of Law. Professor Landy joined the faculty uh, at the start of the 21st century, uh, around the year 2000, and retired uh, a few years uh, ago. Professor Landy is one of the leaders of the field of dispute resolution, having written in a wide range of topics, including dispute system design. His most recent book titled Litigation Interest and Risk Assessment helps your clients make good litigation decisions and which we will discuss later today is of, of particular relevance to this course. Uh, John, thanks for uh, sharing your time with us today. Thanks for inviting me, Raphael, and I look forward to this conversation. Uh, John, one of the challenges of teaching this course in law school is that it is really unlike any uh, other course in the curriculum. So perhaps a way to start this conversation uh, is if you can tell us how do you define dispute system design and why do you think it's a relevant course for law students and lawyers to, uh, to take? Great. Well, um, I do think it's very relevant. Um, and dispute system design, people think of it as um, planning to manage disputes often thinking about a stream of disputes. And so often they're thinking of it in the context of organizations. So a court may be doing some dispute system design or a corporation might, or um, a nonprofit organization or a government agency might. And so they're thinking about when they have a series of disputes that may be similar, uh, instead of just dealing with them on an ad hoc basis, they will try to analyze it, the disputes, the series of disputes, figure out what's common to them and how they can handle it. So it's often thought about in the context, as I say, of a stream of disputes by an organization. I have a broader conception of it. Um, so for example, and what may be particularly relevant for JD students and for practicing lawyers has to do with uh, legal practice. People don't usually think about dispute system design in the context of a legal practice, but uh, even if you're a solo practitioner, you are dealing with a series of disputes. And so you can benefit from analyzing what the series of disputes are and what your procedures are and how you can manage the disputes to be most successful in achieving your goals. So you can think of dispute system design as a way to manage a practice as a lawyer or as a neutral. So for example, if you're a mediator or an arbitrator, you can also think about doing this kind of planning. And then even in the context of a single case, uh, and, and actually, let me just mention, uh, I'm gonna plug uh, this book. Let me see if I can get it to a point where you can see it. It, oh, crap. it looks like it's getting lost in the background. So we, uh, the color might be the the same as the green screen. I'm afraid so. I'm going to uh, change the background so you're actually going to see my real. Um, there you there go. You, now, now we see it. <laughs> now you see it. You can see my uh, my home office. So this is uh, a book that I wrote several years ago that talks about how lawyers can plan for dealing with disputes um, starting from the outset. And so this is a form of dispute system design and the book talks about that, um, published by the ABA. This latest book that I um, you mentioned, um, which I'll also hold up, also published by the ABA, um, talks about it on an individual case basis. And so lawyers and neutrals, particularly mediators, can think about how to manage a dispute. And this is particularly relevant in the modern era after coronavirus, where so much is being done online. And so instead of uh, what we have recommended, uh, my co-authors and I, is um, breaking a mediation up instead of doing it all in one day. I mean, actually, before we get to that, mediators have been doing dispute system design planning uh, for it for a long time so that they have been uh, having conversations and collecting information before everyone convenes. And then they're 
planning how they're going to manage the process once everybody is together. And then often if parties haven't reached an agreement at the end of a, a session, they may continue on. So they've been doing this dispute system design. And now in the age of, of common video uh, mediation, uh, there are opportunities to do that even more to break it up. So that's a long answer to your question, but dispute system design is a process of planning to handle disputes um, and is very relevant to law students. No, thank you. That was a great answer. And I appreciate you trying to uh, connect in uh, the relevance of the course to the type of practice that most of our students will, will find themselves. I think that was very thoughtful. Uh, today, though, we are going to be talking primarily about the role that assessment, methods, evaluation, and that data play in the dispute system design process. Uh, why do we need assessments and evaluation in the design process? Let me sort of frame it another way. We all know what conflict is and we all know why, why conflict happens. So why do we need to, to inquire any further? Isn't, aren't the causes of conflict obvious? Well, um, let me answer it in two ways. In some ways you can think of this as a parallel to uh, a lawyer handling a dispute. Why does a lawyer need to investigate the facts? Don't you just already know the facts? Your client comes in, tells you the other side has done them wrong, and that's all you need to know. Well, obviously that's not the case. You need to learn about the case. You need to learn about what the client's interests are, what the other side's interests are. You need to do an assessment. So again, there's a parallel in terms of what lawyers do in practice. Um, for individual cases. Now, thinking about in the organizational context, there are a lot of reasons why you can't do this, um, why, why you need to do an assessment. The first one is that um, the person doing the assessment um, has his or her own biases. So, and this is particularly true for those who are interested in dispute resolution. You may come in like a bull in a china shop and say, I know what needs to be done you need to have more mediation, you need to have arbitration, you need to do this or that. And one's own biases can blind one to what the real circumstances are and the needs and interests and desires of the various stakeholders. So the first reason is you need to get past your own biases and then uh, all the stakeholders themselves have their own biases, including whoever is the authority who's con contracting for the the person doing the dispute system design, planning, and assessment. And, and typically, there are just a whole range of stakeholders, and they're going to have a variety of different interests and perspectives. And to really make a system work, you really need to understand the perspectives of the various stakeholders. So if, you, if there are key stakeholders who need to be satisfied in the way the, the system works and you don't get their input, the system that you design is not going to work well. So you really need to understand how the system works in the perspectives of the various stakeholders. So uh, thank, thanks. Uh, I hear you saying then that sometimes the reasons why conflict exists are not apparent uh, and thus that conducting an evaluation will help us um, identify those, those conflicts. Could you say a little bit about what are some of the design problems that can be prevented by incorporating assessment and evaluation earlier on, early on into, into the process? And this might relate a little bit to your former book, The Plan Early Evaluation. So maybe you can tell us a little bit about that. Well, and this kind of builds off of what I was just talking about in terms of making assumptions um, and the biases that various people have. Uh, and so if you don't um, consider carefully what the, um, the circumstances are and you just plow ahead, then you may design a system that doesn't work because it, it doesn't reflect the interests of various stakeholders. So, I mean, that's the, the risk if you, you don't get the information, it's like, in a case that a lawyer has. If you go to trial and you haven't done all the discovery, what's the risk? The risk is that you will get ambushed at trial because the other side will present evidence that you weren't aware of. So you really need to understand the situation as carefully as you can 
um, so that you can make the best possible decisions. Let me, before we get to the, to, to, to the main topic, let me ask you one, one final uh, preliminary question, which is when we hear the word assessment, methods, evaluation, data, that sounds like numbers. Uh, we came to law school because we didn't like numbers. So how do we, how do we respond to, to a student who said, I'm a lawyer, I don't do numbers. Uh, don't talk to me about uh, data evaluation and the like. Well, if you don't like dealing with numbers, then you should find another profession because lawyers deal with numbers all the time. Uh, I don't know, maybe there are some types of practice where lawyers don't deal with numbers, but um, one of the things that I assume that most of your students already have experienced is the fact that most of the remedies in court are monetary. And so um, whatever the party's non-monetary interests are, the legal system converts them into numbers. And so lawyers deal with that all the time. So uh, if you don't like dealing with numbers, get used to it, get over it, find another profession. Uh, and, and this is true in, uh, in certainly in litigation. And it's also true for many aspects of transactions. I mean, if you're going to be advising parties about a deal, uh, they're going to want to be very concerned about what the expected profits or outcomes may be uh, numerically. So um, you really do need to understand numbers. And these numbers aren't particularly more sophisticated or complicated, and actually in a lot of ways are less so than the numbers that uh, lawyers need to deal with in practice, particularly if you're going to deal with tax consequences, which, you know, I, I won't even get into that. So, uh, you know, you, you need to, it, it's not a big deal. Just Get over it. Get over it. I, li I like that. So, okay, you convinced me. I think assessment and evaluation matters. Uh, matter. Uh, so let's let's explore now that issue in more detail. Um, let maybe start with this question. What are some of the common methods that designers use to collect data or information more broadly? Yeah, um, probably the most two most important ones are. Uh, interviews and surveys. And uh, I think a lot of people have the assumption that you want to collect data, you got to do a survey. And, um, and, and surveys may actually be helpful, but they're really hard to do well. And usually, in order to do it well, you need to collect a lot of preliminary information so that you can ask the right questions and ask them in a way that's going to produce useful data. So in general, my suggestion is that designers start by doing interviews. And what is an interview? It's what lawyers do all the time anyway. Again, this is not uh, a foreign skill for, for lawyers. You're going to be interviewing clients. You're going to be interviewing witnesses. You're going to be having these kind of conversations with uh, counterpart lawyers, the lawyers on the other side of a case where you're trying to elicit information from them. So. Uh, basically, you are going to be asking a series of questions. Um, typically, they're what social scientists refer to as semi-structured interviews. You start off with some general questions, and then based on the answers to the questions, you may ask some follow-up questions. And so the data is in the form of language, which a lot of people assume that data has to be numerical. Um, that is just not so. Um, and actually, you can get some of the most valuable, meaningful, persuasive data in the form of quotes. Um, so that's uh, an important way. And what you want to do is you want to start off by uh, interviewing the people who hired you um, to find out their perspective and find out who they think the key uh, stakeholders are and the people who are gonna be in the best position to give you information. And then you're probably gonna to wanna to use what's called a snowball uh, sampling process. At the end of each interview, you'll say, well, who else should I talk to? Who would be in a good position to give me information? And, and what are the different groups that um, I need to hear from so that I can get a, a complete um, picture or as good a picture as possible? So that's the first one. and often that may be all you need. Um, now, if you have a large organization and maybe a variety of different perspectives within various stakeholder groups, 
then you may want to do a survey, which as I say, is actually much, much harder than you might think. Um, and part of the challenge is that when you do a survey, typically people are thinking about uh, closed ended questions. Uh, so you're going to ask a question, basically a multiple choice question, which all the students are familiar with, having taken the SAT and the LSAT and a zillion other uh, exams uh, leading up to where you are today. Uh, and so it's, it, it's tricky because you have to ask the right questions. You have to use language that the, uh, that the respondents are going to understand in the way that you intend and they should all understand it uh, in the same way. And when you give them response options, um, you need to give them options that are going to fit with the answers that they want to give you. Um, this is actually very, very tricky. Um, and if you want to do this, um, I suggest that you talk to someone who and work with someone who is an experienced social scientist to help you or at least um, pretest the survey um, carefully. So those are the two main methods. Um, one can also do observation. Um, you can go and just walk around and see how things work. Um, for example, if you're interested in seeing how a mediation process works in a court mediation program, you might go and observe some mediation. So those are some of the main ways to do uh, data collection. Uh, thanks, uh, Yun. That That's a really helpful uh overview uh, seems to me of some key um, assessment uh, and data gathering methods. Let me, let me, I think also interesting is the way you frame it, uh, which I think is reassuring for our students that in a sense they already know or they have the, 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 the training and the skills to do this because interviews are what lawyers have to do uh, all the time, you know, in, every, in every context. So, uh, at least getting started I should be somewhat uh, somewhat familiar. I also appreciate the, the, the different methods, the interview, the survey, uh, observation. Let me just go back and talk a little bit about some of the specific aspects of sure. things that you mentioned. Uh, so let me start with interviews. So you talked about structured and I guess unstructured interviews. Um, can you say a little bit more about that distinction let me, let me start with that and then I have another follow-up. Sure. Well, actually there are, one can think of sort of three general categories. I've given you the one in the middle. Um, one, you can have completely unstructured interviews and you might do that at the very outset where you don't know even what questions to ask. And so you go and you talk to people and you, you don't have a series of questions to ask, you just, say, I'm interested in finding out about this general situation. And based on the answers they give you, you ask follow-up questions. So that's a completely unstructured interview. On the other end of the continuum, you have completely structured interview, which in some ways is like the survey that I was talking about where you ask specific questions and you don't have these follow-ups. You just ask the questions you aren't necessarily, and these are typically looking for uh, open-ended answers. So you're not asking to have them give you a, a multiple choice answer where you're giving them limited response options. You may ask them a question and then um, just have them answer it. Um, one of the things that's really, again, helpful in the age of uh, common use of video is you can do these um, interviews by video and uh, they, the system, some of them will create a transcript. When I was a graduate student back in the dark ages, you know, I would have an audio transcript and it, you'd have to pay someone to transcribe it, which would take a lot of time or do it yourself. Now the systems can generate transcripts on their own. And these, these interviews can just produce extremely vivid uh, in, uh, uh, descriptions of, of people's perspectives and, and give the emotions and the feelings and the concerns behind that the just answering a, a, a fixed um, option, uh, fixed choice question can't. And, uh, and you know, I, more, well, you're probably going to ask me about the, the short answer question, so I can talk about that next if that's where you're going. 
Yeah, and well, exactly right. I guess related to that, so that you also talk about, I think, open and closed questions. And this is something that I believe most of our students will have uh, at least heard of. Uh, it's something that we cover in the lawyering course with obviously you right. help, help design and, and taught for, for many years. Um, so maybe we can, we can talk a little bit about uh, the, the open, closed questions and, and other forms of questions. So again, sort of building on what I was just saying, that the open questions are ones where you don't give in advance what the options for response are. Um, and so these typically are verbal um, answers. And then the um, closed questions are ones where you do and you're giving them a, a set of choices to choose from. The advantage of the closed questions is that you're able to make some quantitative assessments that are harder um, or maybe impossible with the open questions. And so if you ask, if you're using the uh, survey with these closed questions, it's easy to administer to a large number of people and you can have more confidence that people are answering the same question. And so you can come up with uh, in the first instance, uh, what are called frequency distributions, you can find out what percentage of the population or the sample um, answers in particular ways. And having those numbers is useful and then you can break them down and so you can look and see what different stakeholder groups, um, how they may respond differently to the different questions and you can do a variety of other statistical analyses Again, you don't have, I mean, if you do those two simple things, which I am sure that every student in your class can do, that would be all you need to do. You don't need to do more sophisticated statistical techniques. If you really were wanting to do that and you knew about that and where you were working with a social scientist or uh, who could help you, then that would be fine. But basically, if you just do percentages, um, then that's, all you need to do with these closed questions. And so typically it's useful to do both. And, and what I recommend is, and what I've done in, in the research that I've done, is you start with the, uh, the interviews and that helps you figure out what it is that you really want to ask and what the issues are. And then based on that, you can then devise good uh, surveys. And if you're going to do a survey, one of the things that I strongly, strongly, strongly recommend is that you pretest the survey. Um, you may assume that the respondents are going to understand the words the way you do. So for example, and again, students who are interested in dispute resolution think they know what mediation is, and they assume that everybody else knows what mediation is. Well, two things. One is people in our field have very different understandings about what mediation is, and mediation is very different in different contexts. But even assume that we all have the same, under, we all within our field have the same understanding about what mediation is. People who aren't in our field may not. So part of what you need to do is write questions and provide response options that match the cognitive categories uh, and understandings of the people who are going to be answering the questions. In order to do that, you need to pretest it, basically have some people who are from the, the sample population um, t take it and see how they're answering it. Some of the ways to do that is to have them do a think aloud. So you have them uh, answer, read aloud a question and then say, hmm, how am I gonna answer that? And you can see uh, what they're saying. And you can say, well, when I use the word mediation or I use the word whatever word, you know, what does that mean to you? And so by, it, it, it's a, it's a really important investment of time because if you don't do that, you can come up with questions and then you look at the data and you say, well, I'm not sure that this answers the question because people may have understood it improperly. So you can invest a tremendous amount of time in data collection with surveys. And if you don't design it well, you're not going to get the data that's going to be helpful for you. So a long answer to the question, surveys can be helpful. You need to do it carefully. And pretesting is something that I would heartily recommend. 
And it seems to me you are also, what I hear you saying is that the interview and the survey are not uh, uh, exclusive, no, uh, but, but are in a sense complementary to each other, that, that a good interview uh, will lead, will uh, provide information that will uh, help you prepare a better survey, a more useful uh, survey. Identify to be sure that you and the subjects are speaking the same language, so to speak, you know, that are understanding the term and that's information that only the interview can provide so that you can prepare a better, better uh, survey. Let me just, um, uh, an aside a little bit, but you earlier on talk about the importance of uh, recognizing one biases when as a designer, no, and, the, and why we, you know, why evaluating is important. But when you conduct an interview, aren't you opening the door for biases to seep back in into the process? No, you are listening to someone, you are uh, hearing, you no, know, I guess what they are saying uh, in the context of your own biases. Uh, how do you, and, and if you let them go, that might then taint the survey, no? So how, uh, what would you recommend us as interviewers to be aware of as we conduct those interviews to avoid those those biases to attain the process? Sure. Well, uh, first, a general comment, uh, and that is that uh, there's no way to avoid bias in any aspect of life and any aspect of dispute resolution in drafting uh, survey questions, uh, you can include biases just in the choice of words and the choice of questions you ask and the sequence of questions you ask. So, you know, just because it's supposedly objective um, doesn't mean that there aren't biases. Um, so, and, and one needs to be looking into that and that's part of the, the value of doing the pretesting that I mentioned. Now, in terms of the um, the interview, uh, what social scientists do is they try and be very conscious of their own biases and they look for alternative explanations and they'll ask the subjects about alternative ways of looking at things. Um, and um, so in some ways, again, really parallel to being a good lawyer, a good mediator, uh, when someone gives you an answer you want to think about alternative possible explanations and in a very tactful way, uh, ask them about that. Um, and, and part of it is, you know, lawyers and mediators have our own biases as well. And to be a good lawyer or mediator or arbitrator, you should be aware of your biases and think about how to frame your questions in a way that are gonna produce answers with as little bias in the response as possible. And, um, and just be self-conscious of the fact that, that biases will creep into, or can creep in, probably will creep into any form of data collection that one undertakes. Thank you, that's, that's very helpful. So let, let me shift gear now and talk about Lira. So what is uh, litigation interest and risk assessment uh, which is again the topic of your your most recent book and um, tell us about that and tell us why you think is relevant to the dispute system design process. Sure well um, uh, thank you for asking about this this is actually a book that I co-authored with two Canadian uh, law professors um, Michaela Keat and Heather Haven and uh, the the book starts off by talking about the fact that lawyers and parties generally do a rotten job of making decisions about going to trial. There is data, there is replicated social science data that shows in the vast majority of cases, one side or the other gets a worse result at trial than uh, the other side's prior offer. So think of it this way, if uh, you were um, representing a plaintiff and the defendant made you an offer of $100,000 and you go to trial and you get a verdict of $50,000, this is a rotten result for you and your client. Not only are you getting less money, 
or your client is getting less money, but you're investing more time and money to get it. And there's just a lot of stress and anxiety on the client's part. So there's research that suggests that when people are considering going to trial, they're making bad results. Now, a couple of caveats to that. One is that this is focused on all of those cases going to trial, as hopefully your students know. Uh, in the United States, relatively few cases actually go to trial. In the federal courts, it tends to be 1%, give or take. In state courts, it varies, but it may be 5 or 10% of cases so uh, that are filed. Um, now, not all the other ones are settled, but still you're looking at a, a lot of them. Most cases are settled, and so it's not that people necessarily are making bad decisions in those cases, although even there they may not be. Lawyers have a, a, an ethical duty to provide candid advice to clients, which sounds easy and obvious, um, and it's extremely difficult. Um, and so that's really what this book is about. And the book provides a framework of a structure for doing an analysis that can be uh, extrapolated to dispute system design. And the structure involves three elements. Uh, and I'll start talking about it in the context of a litigated case. So you can think about uh, what the expected court outcome would be. You can think about the tangible costs, the future tangible costs at a given point um, from then forward to get to trial, and then also the intangible costs. So for example, if you have a case where you as a plaintiff's attorney think that it would, um, you're, you do an analysis of the law and the facts and everything you do to come up with your best estimate of what would happen if you actually went to trial, which is actually a very tricky thing to do. But you, you come up and you say, you assume that it will be $100,000 would be the trial verdict. Well, to get to trial, it's gonna cost your client some additional amount for your additional legal fees. You may have some expert fees, uh, deposition costs. So let's just say that's another $10,000. Um, and then, we talk about the third element, which is something that most lawyers and probably many law students overlook, which are intangible costs. And there are a whole range of things. One of the things that law school generally doesn't teach about is the client's perspective. Clients often are portrayed as bystanders in the case book cases that you read. Um, and yet they are the central people in the life of lawyers. Um, that's your job is to try and advance their interests. And uh, going to through litigation or negotiating a transaction is extremely stressful. And what the book talks about, both for individuals and for org organizations, are a lot of the intangible costs and interests that parties have in the litigation process. And so one is just avoiding stress. And the book describes in gut-wrenching detail the physical and psychological damage that just going through litigation can impose on parties. Um, it can hurt reputations, repu uh, relationships for organizations and, and individuals. You lose opportunities. You're spending time focused on the litigation that you could spend doing all sorts of other things. You know, the saying, you know, you'll never get that time back. Um, you um, may have to spend, um, uh, you know, time and effort to repair a uh, relationship. So those are the three elements, the expected court outcome, the tangible costs and the intangible costs. And by combining the three of those things, you can come up with a bottom line. So in the example I gave you, you might ask a client, let's say you're my client. And I say, well, um, I know you find this litigation process really stressful. How much would it be worth it to you to settle today as opposed to going to trial and taking your chances. And you might say, well, I guess I'd be willing to take $20,000 less. So given that, you might say, I'll take, you know, deduct from the $100,000 that I expect to get at trial, I'll deduct the $10,000 for the additional legal fees and the $20,000 that it's worth it to you to avoid the trial. So that says to you that your bottom line is $70,000. So that if the defendant offers you anything over $70,000, it's worth it for you to take it, even though if you went to trial, you assume that you would get $100,000. So 
that's the structure it's thinking about kind of what the the client's net interests are or bottom line um, and uh, as you probably know I've written about uh, how um, this term BATNA, best alternative to negotiated agreement, is so misleading because people focus only on that first part, the value of the expected court outcome, and they don't focus as much on the tangible costs and especially the intangible costs. So that's about the book generally. Now, how? let me extrapolate that to dispute system design and the same sorts of considerations would be involved. So you want to think about what the main uh, goals are of the organization or the whatever it is, the system that you're designing. Um, and that would be analogous to the court outcome. Think about the costs that would be involved to develop that system. And then think about particularly importantly, all these ancillary interests that people may not necessarily identify um, at the outset, but part of your assessment would find out what their concerns really are. So I'm going to um, share a screen here and show you a whole bunch of uh, uh, possible other goals. So um, some of the goals may be helping people manage conflicts and avoid destructive disputes. So let's just say, again, we're in a law school setting. People are thinking about a court context. So you're going to design, say, a court mediation program. So often the main goals that the judges or the court administrators are going to have is to say, well, we want these cases to be resolved sooner. We want to have more of them resolved. Okay, well, that's their main goal, but there are other goals that if they think about it, they may or may not um, be interested in or some of the various stakeholders may be. So helping manage conflicts and avoid destructive disputes giving parties the choice of a variety of dispute resolution processes is a really important one in my view. Increasing parties' control of the dispute resolution process and outcome, increasing procedural and substantive fairness. You know, we, <laughs> we talk about, um, you know, th this is a system of justice. Um, it's really a system of law and hopefully it's gonna produce justice and perceived fairness, but that isn't always the case and you wanna have the, the stakeholders, particularly the parties, experience that, um, both in terms of having the process feel fair to them and the outcomes feel fair. Um, another one may be to use the party's values and norms in dispute resolution, not necessarily what the, the law would provide. Um, another one would be to create value, producing resolutions that better satisfy all parties' interests. Um, improving dispute resolution for disadvantaged individuals and groups is an important one, particularly in today's world where we're more conscious of the systemic uh, disadvantages that minorities and other groups um, have faced. Um, and it's important to design systems to overcome systemic injustice. And so that's something that people have tried to do in the past. And it's, I think, going to be increasingly important in the future, something that really should be a part of every analysis, but unless you consciously ask about it and incorporate it into the design, it may get overlooked. Um, protecting interests of unrepresented third parties, improving parties' ability to handle disputes on their own. Okay, let me see. If, um, increasing parties' empathy and concern for others, reducing tangible and intangible costs, reducing the time required, reducing the use of trials and courts generally. Um, one of the things I should say about that is in the dispute resolution field, there's some people um, I think are overly critical about the courts and trials. And I wanna say that I think that courts and trials are extremely important. Um, this is particularly important for law students who are uh, about to go into the profession of practicing law and maybe doing litigation. And th th these are fundamental institutions of our society that are essential. The problem is that courts and trials have all these costs and often it's better for, for the parties and for society and for the courts if not everybody goes to court and not every, all the cases um, are tried. And to have the courts really try cases that 
particularly need to be tried or appropriate to be tried. So I just want to say, you know, from my perspective, I'm not here to put the courts out of business and to end all trials. It's really a matter of uh, reducing the use of trials in courts or maybe reframing that to say, you know, uh, having the courts and trials only for cases where it's particularly appropriate, um, improving the quality and simplicity of dispute resolution processes, uh, providing appropriate confidentiality, preserving relationships, reducing hostility, improving compliance with, um, with the, the settlements and adjudications, um, and developing a, a cohorts of skilled and ethical practitioners, improving court procedures, reducing burdens on courts, developing support for dispute resolution processes, improving achievement of organizational goals through conflict management techniques, and changing the popular culture to value constructive uh, conflict management processes and to devalue destructive ones. So I've just gone through a long list of other goals, um, what I think of as these intangible interests that people might overlook. And these are ones that distribute system designers should be paying attention to and maybe asking about uh, whether they are concerns of the particular stakeholders. Now you can't do all of these things and there are trade-offs between them. And so part of what this des design process is to figure out is what the priorities are um, for the various stakeholder groups. And by doing the assessment that we've been talking about, the designers are, are able to help the stakeholders make the best possible decisions to design a system to achieve the goals that they are most concerned about. Thank you, Jan. That's that's fascinating. I think it helps us um, place in context uh, the role of the designer. Um, it's all of these that this long list that you share are things that the organization, you know, the client, might not be thinking of. You no, know, these these are these these might not be under under radar and and talks. I talk about adding value, you know, the designer by bringing this into the picture might, uh, might certainly change the perspective of the, uh, of, of the client. And I guess to take it back to the, to the beginning uh, and the, the, the process of interviewing, bringing this mindset and exploring whether the organization, uh, at least folks within the organization are thinking about some of these issues uh, will be a, a, a very helpful part of the of the design design process. And if I can just piggyback onto that, going back to the role of the individual lawyer, part of the value that lawyers can add to clients is to help them become more conscious of interests that they have that they may not be aware of. And so one of the things that we have in this book is a whole laundry list of questions to, that lawyers should be asking their clients to find out what their interests are that the clients may not be aware of and that if the lawyers don't systematically and consciously ask about, they may ignore. Um, there's an appendix in the book, well actually several appendices in the book that provide that and one of my blog posts uh, includes a whole series of questions along those lines. Um, and I'll send you a link to that blog post and you can provide it to the students, which again, many of the students aren't going to be doing dispute system design in their practices, but probably a large number of them are gonna be representing clients and often in dispute context and asking these questions and helping clients understand what their interests and concerns are is a really important function that lawyers should do and um, I wish was more prominent in legal education than it is. So I cer certainly agree and I'll be happy to forward that to the students. Well, Jan, I think uh, it has been a fascinating uh, uh, conversation. I, I truly appreciate uh, you sharing your time with us. Uh, we will be, I'll be sharing this with students uh, during, the, during the semester. Um, and um, I appreciate again uh, your, your time and uh, the context that you have provided us here. So thank you so very much. Thank you, uh, Rafael. It's my pleasure. I wish all of your students well 
Um, of course, I wish that in any case, but obviously these are especially difficult times and uh, I, I hope they can manage as well as possible. Thank you, Jan. 